What is going on, everybody? We are going to be kicking this thing off in just a minute. Today, we are going to be talking about these uh, misguided protests that we've been seeing all across the country and what they actually mean. Uh, and we are also going to discuss the Taft-Hartley bill that was introduced in 1947 and what that meant for the labor movement uh, as uh, part of the series where we are be we've been talking about labor movements. So stay tuned, hit that like button, hit that share button, get the word out to some friends. We are going to be kicking this thing off in just a minute. Stay tuned. All right, everybody, we're ready to kick this thing off. Welcome to another episode of Road Reflections. I'm back at the computer, which means I got to wear my sunglasses because uh, uh, my eyes are still uh, strained. Um, so if you're uh, welcome, this is episode 101, 101, we're the big, the big 101. We've we've crossed into into the into the centennial range um, we are, we are, uh, uh, in, into a new century with this show. Uh, so, um, you know, but I still gotta, I still gotta wear those sunglasses, you guys. Um, uh, the, uh, I got this bright light over here. I got a bright light coming in from that side and I got a bright computer screen over here. Um, so gotta wear these sunglasses. I've been, uh, I've been doing a little bit better with the, with the eye strain situation, uh, for, for those kind of keeping up with, uh, with these check-ins at the top of the show, doing, doing a little bit better with the eye strain situation. Um, it could be better. Uh, I went, uh, virtually all day yesterday, um, without needing my sunglasses to look at the screen to do the work. Um, but I did do, I was, I was looking at the screen a lot less yesterday um, you know, today we're, we're back at it. We were, I was staring at the screen to do readings of, of the articles and stories and videos that, that, that were, were part of the, um, the research, uh, for these videos today. So, um, you know, I decided to wear my, I tried not to, I did, I did start the research, um, you know, without the sunglasses and within maybe 20, 25 minutes, I, my eyes were starting to get a little achy. So I, I didn't want to chance it. So, you know, they are getting better. I'm feeling, I'm, I'm, I am feeling a lot better than the headaches have reduced significantly since I've been wearing these. Uh, so I'll probably wear these for a little while longer, um, until, you know, and, and kind of ease myself back into, uh, just making sure that I can, uh, you know, just wear my regular glasses. Uh, so, um, yeah, but I'm feeling okay today. Uh, I've got a decent amount on my plate um, in terms of projects and that I am uh, pushing forward on. Um, one of them being this uh, live-ish Zoom show that I'm going to be doing uh, Saturday, April 25th at 8.30 p.m. is a test show. Uh, it's free. Their space is limited to 10 people. Uh, the ticket link is available for that, and the reason I'm running it through a ticket link is for a couple of reasons. One, it helps me keep track of who's uh, showing up to these things. Um, two, it's a extra level of security. And basically, you purchase, purchase, right? You're getting it for free. Uh, you register for the ticket link, and then an hour before the Zoom show, I send you all of the information that you would need in order to log in, put a password in, um, and then uh, get approved to come in to the Zoom show. So it's a little bit of security um, in regards to that. And, uh, and really what this is going to be, it's going to be short 30, 40 minutes tops, right? 30, 40 minutes tops. And it... Um, I'm going to run through a little bit of the material that I'm working on, maybe one or two little like current eventsy news sort of thing that I'm trying to develop as well uh, for these shows. Um, see what tech specs I need to be aware of 
some technical, you know, technical related things that I'm going to be aware of. So it'll be a short show. It'll be 30 to 40 minutes, you know, to kind of just run a test to see what I'm going to need to do to see where my attention is going to be and see what I what, you know, what uh, problems might pop up and how to eradicate those problems. So and the only way I can do that is by running a test with you guys. So so that's what it'll be. So if you're interested in that, I will post the link to that in the comment section. And, um, you know, you can uh, you can check that out. Um, like I said, space is limited to 10. And going forward from that, too, is I'll, I'll try to run a poll. Maybe I'll run a poll on Twitter or see what Facebook poll shit I can run. Um, and basically, I will try to figure out what day of the week works best. I don't want to do it on Saturdays only because I know Ron Placone and Graham Elwood run their show on Saturday. And I don't, one, I don't want to compete with them. Two, they're friends of mine, so why would I want to compete with them? And three, it, I know we have crossover fans, and I don't want to have anybody make a choice between Ron and Graham's show or my show. I want you to be able to enjoy both shows. And the way that I'll run the ticketing system is uh, basically it'll be five bucks. You know, same kind of thing. It'll be run through brown paper tickets. You'll get the, the link and the password to the Zoom meeting an hour before the show. Um, and if you can't afford it, if you're like, hey, things have been tough, tougher than, you know, I would like them to be. I would really like to see your show. Great. I'll give you a code and you can get in for free. Just hit, let me know, you know, shoot me a message. Um, I understand we're all kind of going through a difficult time. And what I will do is the first show, whenever we decide whether it's, you know, it's going to be a Friday night show or a Sunday night show or a Thursday night show or whatever it is. Um, I will, uh, you know, create a code for people that that would want to see it. And, and, and then I'm also going to limit it to 15 ticket purchases and probably only five codes so that we don't have more than 20, 25 people um, in the first one, just so I can kind of manage things a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, just so I can kind of have a, a, a be able to concentrate on the show and not have to worry about, you know, who's got their fucking mic on while they're chewing on some chips or their phones going off in the background or they're watching NCIS or some shit, you know. So um, kind of limiting the number a little bit smaller because I'm also going to have my sustaining members get in for free as well. They'll get a code as well so I can kind of consolidate everything into the Bandcamp thing. So I'm not sending, you know, links to four different platforms um, and everything is kind of streamlined and easy. Um, so, yeah, so, there, so, so that's one of the projects I'm working on. My album's coming together, uh, getting ready to be released June 1st. June 1st is when that's going to come out. Um, I'll probably make an event for that and uh, try to, um, I don't know, try to make a big deal out of it or, or whatever. <laughs> um, see who, who wants to talk about it, who wants to cover it or anything. The album's called Politely Angry. It was recorded in uh, three different places because I lost my album recording date, so I had to kind of use um, recordings from my phone. Um, and I had to do the audio engineering myself because it's just not something that I can uh, spend money on because I'm not making the income that I would normally make at this point. So um, I engineered it myself. So the sound quality is not going to be like, you know, if an actual sound engineer that had like Pro Tools to edit and kink and make sure everything sounds crisp and good and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but it was recorded at the Improv Shop in St. Louis. Um, you know, shout out to my friend Rafe Williams, who's got a fantastic album that he also recorded at the Improv Shop in St. Louis. Um, the Wayward Kraken in Biloxi. Uh, shout out to LB for setting that show up. Uh, and uh, the Boulder Coffee House in uh, Rochester, New York, uh, and shout out to the Rochester City Paper and Chris Hassenauer, who, uh, who helped with that show. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so, so the material is kind of cobbled together from those three, uh, th those three shows. Um, and then on Bandcamp, 
which I highly recommend you go get my stuff from Bandcamp for a couple reasons. One, uh, they're kind of an in independent music distributor, and two, they give the most back to artists. They're the most artist friendly. Um, they are doing 100% uh, of the revenue going directly to the artists right now. They're extending that through May. Uh, so, you know, if you want to get my albums, I highly recommend going through Bandcamp to do that uh, because iTunes and Spotify, especially Sp Spotify is garbage. Um, it, you know, I, um, I, I, would rather, I would rather you uh, go through a uh, platform that is um, more artist friendly than anything else. Uh, so I've got that coming out, Bandcamp, and right now all of my albums are available as pay what you want on Bandcamp as well. So if you want to get it for free on Bandcamp because you're going through a tough time, boom, there it is. It's all, it's all good to go. You know, uh, feel free to download and enjoy the albums uh, at your leisure. So I've got that. Uh, I'm working on some writing projects. I'm working on some Forkful of Noodles. Those are the usual stuff that I've got going on. I'm working on some Taboo Table Talk stuff as well. Um, and then the other thing associated with Taboo Table Talk is I'm talking to small business owners and small venue owners about how this COVID-19 situation has affected them and what they're doing to cope with it and what other people can do to help them out um, through this difficult time. Because, when, you know, and we'll talk a, a little bit more in depth in this, is small businesses really didn't receive um, any kind of help during this crisis. So I've got, I've got my uh, hands full. I'm excited about these projects. I'm, um, I'm feeling a little bit more motivated about these projects. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to achieve these goals. Hopefully I won't uh, get to a burnout point. Um, I've been trying to stay focused, um, you know, and, and, and on top of these videos as well. So uh, yeah, if, again, it's one of those things where I'm like, if I don't answer a phone call or, you know, if I don't text you back or if I haven't messaged you in a while or if I'm not checking in on you or anything, it's not because I don't care. It's because I've got I'm trying to keep myself busy and trying to take care of my mental health so that I can be there for other people when they need me to be. So if I'm if I'm a little absent, it's because I'm I'm kind of making sure that I'm on top of uh, my shit um, as well. So, um, you know, this is like I've, I've mentioned this before is this show here that what, what we do uh, when I premiere these shows and I'm in the chats with you guys, um, you know, chatting back and forth, this is me hang. This is this is me being able to hang out with you guys. This is me being able to also check in with you guys about what you guys are up to. So at the top of the show, as I'm doing this check in, if you guys have a check in that you want to do, if you guys want to say, hey, this is the thing I'm working on. Hey, I've been feeling some anxiety about this thing. I'm, I'm in the chats. I'm going to watch. I'm going to read that comment. I'm going to respond to it. Um, you know, so, so, th so that's kind of the way that, um, I'm able to keep up and keep on top of things. So, um, I hope that, you know, you guys take advantage of that, uh, the, uh, the, the check-ins for what they are, but, um, you know, that's, that's sort of the check-in. That's sort of all the projects I got going on. Um, I'm excited about getting those accomplished. I'm excited about putting my nose to the grindstone and, 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 and achieving the goals that I have set to achieve on a daily basis and on a weekly basis so that, um, I can, I can, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing something productive with my time. I'm doing something that is, uh, b uh, that I think is, is fulfilling and valuable. And hopefully you guys get some value out of it as well. Uh, so that is, that is the goal. Some, some mutual, some mutual value benefit, I guess, would be, um, a thing that people might say. I don't know. I don't know if that's what anybody says. Uh, but without any further ado, Let's get into uh, the stories that we're going to talk about. So I want to talk about these protests that have been going on. Um, we, uh, we saw a bunch of them uh, happen all across the country this week. Um, uh, and primarily, I'm trying to think of how exactly I want to phrase this to start. Look, I just think these protests are misguided. Um, I think they're incredibly misguided protests. I think that it is uh, rooted out of fear and misunderstanding of the situation um, and really misunderstanding what, what, what the point of moving forward would be. Um, and a lot of these protests are like reopen the country, reopen my state kind of thing. 
uh, right? Like, so we saw in, in Michigan, everybody was like, reopen Michigan. In Pennsylvania, they're like, reopen Pennsylvania. So there's a bunch of states that did that. And everybody kind of was like, oh, this is, you know, this is about freedom. Um, and that's what they're claiming, right? This is a tra uh, uh, um, infringement of their civil liberties. It's infringement of their rights as Americans, which is so funny. It's, it's so interesting to me because, you know, when Edward Snowden revealed, and these are the same people that don't consider Edward Snowden to be a fucking hero, right, is when Edward Snowden revealed what the NSA was doing about how they're using our... Uh, our, our, our technology and our camera to spy on us and collect data, you know, and the NSA was like, well, we're just kind of doing it to do it. And it's just like, they fucking didn't say a word about it. They were just like, yeah, you got to follow what the government says. If you don't have anything to hide, what you, what are you worried about? Right. And, and it's like, no, that's a violation out of our rights, of a, a constitutional right. That's a Fourth Amendment violation. And those same people are out there going, our rights are being trifled and we should not, we should go back to work. And we have a right to work. And it's like, mm, okay. And that's, that's a, a, a lot of it. That's where a lot of it's starting. Right, they're calling for like a return to work. They want everybody to be employed again. Um, they they want to go back to work because it's their freedom and their right to work. Sure. Uh, do you have the freedom to do whatever job that uh, that you would like to? Yes, absolutely. Do you have the right um, to pursue the work that you would like to? Of course. I'm not disagreeing with any of that. Now, what I will say is uh, that just because sometimes you have the freedom or the right to do something, sometimes you shouldn't do that. You don't need to exercise your freedoms and rights all the time. Like, there, like it is my freedom of expression if I wanted to, to go into a Victoria's Secret and rub my balls on all the mannequins. It doesn't mean that I should. It, it's, it's there, but it doesn't mean that I should. Everybody would love to go back to work. Right? People are kind of going a little loopy-doopy right now. And it's only been a month. It's been a month. It's been a month of this thing. Um, I'm not going to be back on the road till. So even if they do like lift the lockdown ban or what have you tomorrow, like if they were just like, well, we're done back to everybody back to work on tomorrow. And, you know, I'm still out of work till the end of May. I'm, I'm not going to be back on the road till June. And I would love to do that. I would love to go back to on tour. Nothing would make me happier. That's why I like touring as much as I do. You know, I, I love being on the road. I love meeting all those people. I love hanging out with my friends across the country that I've made over the years. I love going back to specific venues because those venues feel like home. You know, the Robin Theater, the Church of Satire, fucking Teehee's Comedy Club that I was just at in March, a Blank Slate. Shakespeare's I mean the list goes on and on about venues that I show up and I genuinely feel like I'm home I'm I, they, they treat you like your family and I miss that shit of course I miss that shit and I have the freedom to do that if I wanted to I could get in my car and go to Cleveland or Detroit or fucking you know Columbus, whatever. But does it make sense to do that right now? It doesn't. Who's going to show up if they're all scared of a, during a pandemic, which, you know, it's, it's like that, that is kind of a scary time. It can be a scary time. Um, but it doesn't make any sense. So freedom without logic is irresponsible and I don't think there's any logic to this action I think this is a misguided scared I don't want to be with myself I don't want to get introspective with myself kind of reaction um, 
And really this call that people want to go back to work because there's a lot of people that are like, this is how I feed my family and I haven't been able to do that, right? Uh, one, it shows just how obsessed with work America is. Rather than, rather than sitting back and going, okay, you know what? I have this time. I'm not one of these people that can uh, find an alternative way to do my job. I'm not one of these people that can do my job online, like hairdressers and you know stuff like that. It's like, yeah, I get it. How are you? Who's who? What virtual way to get a fucking haircut are you gonna do? Right? Like, so either you have to get a mask and go to somebody's house, and they have to be comfortable with you coming into their house and give them haircuts, or you have to bring them over to your house, and they have to be comfortable coming to your house. Um, to, to get these haircuts and so on and so forth, right? I'm just using haircuts as an example because there's, there's been a lot of the people that are like, I, I, wanna, I want the freedom to get my haircut. And it's just like, all right, fucking then, I don't know, ask your wife or whatever. Um, this is the moment where you could sit and go, what do I actually want to do with my life? Who am I as a person? What's my passion? How do I find fulfillment? How do I find joy? And how do I make my fulfillment and joy my job, my occupation? So that work doesn't have to be this bad word. It doesn't have to be this dredge that, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you're like, ugh, I got to fucking sit in my car and I got to deal with all this fucking traffic and I'm doing, I'm going the same goddamn route and I'm going and sitting at the same fucking cubicle, punching the same goddamn clock, doing the same goddamn thing every day, having the same inane conversations at lunch, and then going home and sitting in that same fucking traffic to go home and eat dinner with my same fucking friend. Like, that monotony doesn't need to be what work is. It can be about fulfillment. And instead of taking the opportunity to try to find that, they're out there saying, "Give us, get us back to status quo." It this this doesn't need to be about your need for work to make money. Sure, I mean making money from your work is amazing, and especially when you get to make money from your work that you are passionate about, that you're excited about, and that brings you happiness and fulfillment is incredible. But, you know, if, if that's all it is, then I think we're missing the point here. This, these jobs shouldn't be just about what is going to be profitable. It's about what makes you happy. Ask that question for once. Do a little bit of self-exploration. What did you always want to do? Why, and, and why didn't you get the opportunity to pursue it? And, it? and isn't this the time to pursue it? And the bigger question is, do you want to be happy? Maybe you don't. Maybe you, maybe you like being miserable because at least that misery brings you a profit. And that's all your life is ever going to be about. And if that's it, then that's it. You discovered that about yourself. But I would wager to bet that it's probably not. I would wager to bet that it's probably not. And happiness is a choice that you can make. It's up to you to do what you need to do to make yourself happy. I wouldn't be doing these videos if I didn't enjoy doing these videos. I genuinely enjoy having conversations like this. Um, you know, I genuinely enjoy thinking about this stuff. I gen and I genuinely enjoy sharing these ideas and thoughts with other people in hopes that maybe there's something else that they will share to, to maybe, you know, enlighten somebody, maybe help somebody think a little bit differently. I, I love do, doing this sort of stuff. I, I, I enjoy finding comedic avenues in all these sort of dark shit. That's the choice that you can make now. Fighting for the right to work, fighting for the right to do what? Become another employee so that these corporations can fucking, you know, pay you pittance? That's, that's what you're asking to do. That's what status quo was. Reopen the country to what means? To what means? What are we reopening the country to? To go back to the same shit that we've been doing before all this. The same shit that got us in trouble here in the first place. Why are we interested in taking that step backwards just to arrive at the problem again? 
What is the purpose of that? What is the point of that? There is none, in my opinion. It's an illogical move. What's the, what's the phrase? There's no other way but forward? Is that a phrase? I don't know if that's a phrase. Let's make that a phrase. There's no other way but forward. So let's take a forward momentum. Let's not go back to the way things were. Let's figure out what these protests should be about. Let's, let's, let's add freedom with logic and go forward in figuring out how to protest with, with, with logic in mind. What's the thing we should be looking at right now? I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is small businesses got nothing. They launched a small business loan, uh, for, and it, there was $350 billion um, that was set up. And uh, as far as I can tell, nobody got that fucking loan. People applied for it, but they didn't fucking get it. Small businesses, which are deemed to be 500 employees or less. Uh, Olive Garden doesn't need a fucking loan. They already got one. There's already a corporate bailout. They gave over $5 trillion. Subway doesn't need a loan. Cheesecake Factory, they don't fucking need loans. The small pizza shop that is that is struggling to get by right now, they need a loan. The small venue needs a loan. The the fifty seat venue that operates because people like me show up and I can maybe bring ten people, they need a loan to continue operating, continue paying their employees. And they didn't get one. Where, where are these sons and daughters of liberty protesting that shit? Where are they in that? Instead of saying, get us back to work. Get us back to work. Let's open up these businesses that nobody wants to come to because they're too scared. Why aren't you saying, why the fuck did you do what you promised us you were going to do? Why are you looking at the government going, wait a minute, you guys fucking said you were going to give small businesses, 500 employees or less, these, these loans to help them keep going. And, and you said that if nobody gets fired, if they don't have to lose any staff because they would get these loans, then they don't have to worry about repaying them. Or they'll get it at a reduced interest rate or something. Why didn't they get that? You had no problem giving $4 trillion, $5 trillion to corporations? A Wall Street slush fund? We have people trying to use unemployment and not being able to access that. Small businesses aren't getting what they need. Before everybody sits there and says, well, socialism, it doesn't work. No, 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 this is capitalism. This is not socialism. This is capitalism making sure that social programs are ineffective. There's no reason why they can't make this work. There's no reason why that website can't work. There's no reason why you can't use the census information. You can't use the postal service information to get checks out to people. There's no reason for that. That's not capitalism. That's not socialism. That's capitalism. That's capitalism setting itself so that, so that you know, the, it funnels all the money to the top. It's another fucking notion to try to push trickle down down our throats for no reason. Where are the sons and daughters of liberty protesting that? Why aren't there signs out there saying stop fucking trickle down? Stop trickling shit down. We need help. We need assistance. How about a trickle up? How about a trickle up economy? Where are the signs saying that? Give me liberty or give me death. Great. You're going to die. Because guess what? Just because you want to open up the state of Pennsylvania, just because you want to open up the Michigan, doesn't mean that the citizens of Michigan are going to come support your business. So you're just going to stay open. Risking what? You're not risking anything. Your People's health. 
I mean, there's nothing preventing you right now from going into an empty shop. If you're a hairdresser and you're like, this is how I make my money, okay, open up your barbershop, see who shows up. Very few people are going to show up. You're going to have a bunch of these people that protest, maybe show up, but then they're done. How many haircuts can these people really get? It's, an Ill, it's not logical. It's not logical. Going, having a protest to go back to the fucking status quo doesn't make any goddamn sense. The status quo is what got us into this mess in the first place, that got us to this economic condition in the first place. So why would you want to go back to a system that basically preaches the same fucking thing? Why isn't the protest that, that it's been a month and this government hasn't done a goddamn thing to help the American people? $1,200 stimulus check is all they gave us. To some of us, not all of us. <laughs> some of us can't get the $1,200 stimulus check. Some of the people that make cash, some of the people that are the most poor, some of the people that you know don't make enough income to, to pay taxes don't get that $1,200. The, the, the people that are most vulnerable don't get it. And fucking... <laughs> This is twelve hundred dollars is supposed to last ten weeks. <laughs> That's what Steve Mnuchin said. They're like, oh, it's got to last a little last tw ten weeks. Ten weeks. We figure, you know, the poor's, uh, you know how they're stupid with money. You get how dumb the poor's are with money. Um, we'll say ten weeks. Uh, that's a hundred and twenty dollars a week. Uh, you know. Uh, if they if they run out of food, what I hear is there's a lot of garbage cans. There's a lot of garbage cans out there with some food uh, that uh, that us rich people graciously throw away so that the poor can go hunting in the garbage cans. And uh, and you know we will let them scour our garbage for a very small nominal fee. That way the money lasts for uh, ten weeks. I guarantee you my garbage can is cheaper than the grocery store. Can guarantee that. This fucking out of touch lunatic. It's like it's gonna last ten weeks. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> All this is really showing more and more to me with with this conversation surrounding, uh, oh, we want to go back to work, and you know everything that's happening with how the government's not really helping the working class people. You know, a, a, they're they're putting more money into the corporate slush fund. We need a UBI. We need a universal basic income. I think this pushes us more in that direction, that it proves more and more that we need a universal basic income. If we had a universal basic income, I don't think these people would be out there um, yelling and screaming, putting, putting themselves at risk and other people at risk for, I think, virtually nothing. For, for you to sit there and say, I want to go back to work. If, for the sake of easy math, even if it was $2,000 a month, which is what Ro Khanna and a couple other people are proposing, uh, which is like, we're listening. That's basically how the Democrats are, are running through it. That's both parties are running through, both the Democrats and the Republicans are just like, we're listening, but we're not going to do anything. We're just going to listen. So two thousand dollars would be f roughly five trillion total, which is the exact amount that they just made up out of thin air for corporate interests for as a Wall Street slush fund, and they just gave it out, no questions asked, uh, no delays, no forms to fill out, nothing. They could have easily done that for the American people, and that could have trickled up. There was two thousand dollars a month coming into your pockets as an American citizen. Um, I don't think that we would be seeing these protests right now. I think these people are scared. I think these people are um, uncertain of what the future holds, and they are using this guise of rights and liberties and freedoms as a way to kind of push back against that fear.
the fear of not knowing when they're going to get back to work. If they had that money, there would be less concern of where that food is going to come from. That their work connected to income and profit that's currently not there. If there was if there was a UBI that they could feed their family and there'd be less people protesting out there. If they had a UBI, they could also buy a dictionary so that they could learn how to spell certain words. Because uh, I'm looking at some of these signs going, I, I, how is, aren't you supposed to know English? That's what you fucking yelled at me all those years as an immigrant, is you got to speak English. And it's like, I is. Why don't you learn how to speak English? When you learn how to speak English, then you can yell at me about learning to speak English. You know, if they had a UBI, they could afford a, a, a dictionary, you know? You don't even need to buy it. You can technically just go to mediumwebster.com and look up words. But they, but they would then be able to think about what they want to do with their lives, right? They could, be, they could be a little bit more introspective. They could find a new purpose for themselves in this current situation. Maybe it's going to, going and, you know, uh, joining a mutual aid. Maybe it's being a little bit more active in your community. That's what we need to be protesting. We need to be protesting this misuse of the funds, the misuse of restabilizing an economy during a global pandemic. And there are people that are doing that. We talked about rent strikes last week, rent freezes, um, and the LA Tenants Union, uh, and this was reported by Ron Placone, and there was, so, so Ron Placone reported this, he did a video about it, he talked about it in his show, and that's how I found out about it. And then I tried to see if there was any coverage by any sort of corporate. And there's one. There was one one piece of news that actually covered this shit. And it was uh, ABC or some stupid shit like that. And they just were just like, these people protested in their cars. Which they did. They, they practiced social distancing guidelines. Um, they were in their cars and uh, they asked for a rent freeze. They asked to take care of homeless people, uh, possibly open up abandoned hotels, right? Like there's not a lot of people staying in hotels right now. So maybe open up hotels as homeless shelters to make sure that these people have a place to stay, that they are safe. Uh, you know, maybe try to figure out how to fund more money to food shelters. If people had a UBI, they'd be able to donate to, to these things a little bit more. So, you know, so like food banks are running out of food. $2,000 a month plus a rent freeze plus a mortgage freeze. So that means landlords are also taken care of, right? Uh, oh, the third thing I, I forgot to mention too is essentially if you're, if you're a landlord that uh, unethically practices uh, being a landlord, essentially, right? Like if you're just, if you're just like a shitty landlord, then the tenants get to take actions against you um, to to ensure that you know the tenants' rights are taken care of. Um, that you can't just essentially be a slum lord and get away with it. But again, rent freeze, mortgage freeze, uh, both those things happen. Banks are already bailed out; they already have that four trillion dollars. On top of that, they still keep making astronomical amounts of money anyway. So, like, what are you worried about? Plus, the UBI shows up. Now we have a way to sustain the middle class through a crisis, through a pandemic. So let's say this thing lasts beyond May. Let's say this thing goes into June. You know? Americans will be taken care of. And food banks won't run out of food. So they people go back to saying, okay, I have $2,000 a month. I'm going to donate 
um, I'm going to buy an extra $100 worth of food and I'm going to donate that food to the food bank so that homeless people have something to eat. So that, you know, the hungry kids in low-income families have something to eat. That's a trickle up. You build your foundation. You bail out your foundation. And then you let that stuff guide go up. The fear is, the fear is that coming out of this, more support will go into local, um, more local non-corporate entities, businesses, venues, uh, and the corporate ones won't survive. Good. Sorry. We might see that a universal basic income actually works. It actually doesn't collapse the economy. In fact, it saves it. In fact, it creates a better economy. What we should be protesting is to stop the wheel spinning of unfettered capitalism in the name of freedom. We should be fighting for a better system. We should be fighting for a system that, that legitimately helps people. That doesn't use money as a, as, a, as a limiter, but as a vehicle to help, as a vehicle to, to better humanity. And I don't think capitalism is doing that. There might have been one brief, tiny moment that it did. There might have been this moment where it was like, oh, this thing seems to be awesome. You know, like how when you get something new and it's like, oh, my God, this thing seems so fucking awesome. Right. Like whenever I get a new computer, um, I've had to get three new computers in my lifetime. Right. And that first moment it comes out of the box, you know, you get that new computer smell, which is just toxic chemicals. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, like you just you're just like, this is amazing and it works really well. You know, you can download porn at night, lightning speeds, lightning speeds. I mean, you know, the first thing you do when you open up a computer is just launch seven, eight, 12 porn sites. And just you're just like, how many of these videos can I play all at once? Can I play all? And you can. And then you can. And then over the years, you kind of have to pull back. You know, you only watch maybe four porns at the same time. You know, you got to make an adjustment to it. That's, that's how capitalism is. You know, capitalism is, is like when it came out of the box, you know, it was like, this smells really good, but it was just coal ash uh, and, and fossil fuel toxins that were coming out. And, and, you were, and everybody was like, this is great. This is awesome. Everything is going really, really well. And then more and more, you know, uh, the, the more and more as capitalism kept building and the rules for capitalism got taken down and more became unfettered, the more we kept thinking about freedom, 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 and the more, you know, chains we kept taking out of it, the more it restricted us. We took the chains off capitalism and put them on ourselves. And now we have to make an adjustment to learn how to walk with the chains. We should be fighting for a better system not asking to go back to the same ones. Moving on to the next story. <laughs> um, I want to give you guys a moment to breathe there with me, you know. Uh, take that in. Take look. Look into the future to see what better system we can build. Uh, we are going to talk about the Taft Hartley Act. Taft Hartley Act. Uh, this is a a uh, a union busting bill that was put up in in place in 1947. So let's take a look at how this bill came about, what it says, and uh, and really how it it fought back against unionization. So this is post World War II. This is 1947 is when they're talking about this act. 1947, um, at that point, we had seen two years worth of uh, strikes and protests and pushbacks for better wages, better work conditions, and better jobs in general. 
which was all that was promised to the to the American working class um, during World War II. So they basically said, "Hey, let's put you know um, unionization aside. Let's put uh, you know strikes and collective bargaining aside." Uh, for the war effort, let's make sure that you know um, we win the war. We got to take care of this situation. There is there is uh, fascism and and authoritarianism happening across the country, or happening across the globe. And you know we w what if we're next? We got to fight for what's right. World War Two happens, big manufacturing boom. Everybody goes back to work, right for for the big war effort. They go back to work and, uh, you know, strikes and collective bargaining were paused because freedom, freedom, you know, so World War II ends, come back into a peace economy, and, uh, and now people are seeing that, you know, they, there aren't as many jobs as they were promised. The wages have gone down, so people started striking. It's very similar to what happened after World War I. If you remember the 1919 Seattle strike, the 1919 Winnipeg strike, uh, the general strikes that happened in those cities, the gen and then the strikes that happened all across the country because of that, uh, that eventually led up to the um, 1919 Boston police strike that we all talked about uh, a little while ago. And if you haven't seen those videos, they are available on my channels. So please go check them out. Um, but um, very similar stuff where, you know, the government said, hey, we're going to pause on this, on, on, you know, increasing wages or anything like that and negotiating with you guys because we got to win the war. And the workers were like, well, of course, of course, we got to win the war. We'll do what we need to for the country. We'll stand by you guys. And, uh, and then the war ended. War conditions didn't get better. Jobs ended up, people ended up losing their jobs. There were more veterans that were homeless because there weren't jobs to come back home to. And uh, nobody was getting paid much of anything. And the government was just like, well, I mean, hey, guys, huh? You know me, old government. Huh? Have I lied to you before? Huh? Come on. Me and you, we go way back. Come on. Well, I'm good for it. I'm good for the month. It's coming. It's going to be just fucking don't worry about it. Okay? Just relax. I got to go. And then they, you know, smoke bomb and disappeared. That's basically the same thing in World War II. So part of the reason why, you know, the, the everything kind of comes to this halt is because there's a manufacturing boom when it comes to when it comes to the war effort, because everybody has to get together. We're, we're making tools for, for guns and tanks and planes and U-boats and all this other shit. And then that comes to a stop, and now we have to adjust for a peacetime economy where we're not developing as much shit to go into a war effort. Now we have to figure out what do we need in the country to move forward. Probably agricultural needs, probably health needs, probably, you know, better food, better housing, better living conditions, maybe a better infrastructure, right? So these are peacetime things that we need to think about. And the country didn't adjust to that because the country was set on a wartime economy. Um, and this is sort of the, the, the flaw in capitalism, right? Capitalism it, this is a weakness. This is capitalism's weakness. It's an economic model that's built on more. More, 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 more. It's built on greed. It's built on constantly producing things. It's built on constantly making shit. Uh, and when you get to a point where you don't need to make as much as you did before, right, um, it just falls apart. It just falls apart. It works in booms and busts. Um, you know, it's an up and down economy, but who is it up and down for is never the rich. It's never the banks. It's never the corporations. It's never the, you know, the top 1% of 1%. They never see the economic down. It's us, right? Same. It's, it's the fucking veterans that came back to, 
after the war and couldn't find work? It's the, it's the, the manufacturing wing that worked, you know, long hours at shorter pay to ensure that America wins the war. Those guys are the ones that, that, hit, that, that suffered during the bust. What we need is an economy of stability. One that doesn't go up and down all the time. That kind of stays at a straight, even line. So that when we come into a economy of peace, everything doesn't collapse. That we know how to adjust when we get to that economy of peace. When we have shifting things that, you know, make the economy what it is, for so to speak, right? And it's probably part of the reason why America looked at, you know, they were like, oh, wait a minute, we do really well um, when war is involved. So let's, and, you know, d let's develop a, a, an industry surrounding it, hence the military industrial complex, right? They were just like, wait, these people are striking because they're not making weapons? Fucking let's make all the weapons. And let's sell it around the, let's just make up enemies. Let's, you know, and that, and, and this bill does make up enemies. Well, let's just say the Russians. We fucking don't like you, you commie bastards coming in to, 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 to sneak into the night and, uh, and, and what, and what these, they, they take these straws and they put it into your chest, into your sweet American heart, and they suck out all the freedoms. That's what these commies want to do. Is that what you want? Is that, do you want the freedom sucked out of you? Like, like it's a root beer float made out of hammers and sickles. So they just, we've just been constantly making enemies. Uh, and we have the military industrial complex because we need that war economy. We, we have to drive an economy out of war because in World War II it worked. It worked in that one moment of time. So let's make that moment of time, you know, exist forever. Dwight Eisenhower did uh, warn us about that too. Uh, talked about that in a prior Forkful of Noodles episode um, that um, that I can link to as well. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll put a link to that at the bottom. Uh, so, uh, you know, the Taft-Hartley bill comes in uh to kind of push back against these strikes, to be like, all right, we're done with these strikes. We saw them in fucking the 20s and 30s, and, uh, and they're real bummers for corporations. They're real bummers for, for you know, the, the, these politicians that have to show face and just be like, no, 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 we're for the workers. And then they're actually, like, making us be for the workers? Like, they're actually making us do the work for the workers? Like, the people that we're supposed to rep They're actually making us represent the people that we're supposed to represent. Fucking gross. Let's write a piece of legislation so we don't have to do that again, and we can just force interns to blow us in our, in the, in our offices. That's basically what this bill was constructed to do it's a it's it's a union busting bill that made sure that the unions were didn't have any power written by two senators senator robert taft a republican from ohio and fred hartley a republican from new jersey uh, and if i'm being honest i forget that new jersey is a state uh, and they constructed this bill, which was called the Labor Relations Management Act, which became the Taft-Hartley Act. Uh, Labor Relations Management Act. Oh, what a what a what a nice name, right? When you read the name, you're like, oh, this sounds good, you know, labor relations, and and they're gonna manage labor relations. They're gonna they're gonna make sure like the workers and the employers are gonna be taken care of. Like that sounds so much fun. That sounds like it's like that's such a nice act where everybody gets a little bit, you know, everybody's taken care of. We're gonna be relating to each other. We're building a relationship between labor and management. We're gonna hold hands. We're gonna make sure this sounds like they're gonna democratize the workplace and it's literally the exact opposite of that. That's basically what you got to worry. When, whenever you see these bills come out um, and, uh, and, they're, and they're, it's, it's like, hey, it's the Give Americans 
uh, Give Americans Money Act. It's basically we're going to increase taxes um, on uh, Americans buying groceries and also we're going to tax every breath that you take from the car into the grocery store. Uh, so if you can't hold your breath, uh, also now the parking lots are uh, one and a half miles away from the grocery store. So good luck. This is the American Gets Money Act. This is so <laughs> like it's always the opposite of whatever it is, right? It's like labor relations. It's just like we're going to tear down labor relations. Um, this, is, this was built uh, basically a, a way to defund unions um, and push McCarthyist ideas. Remember, we're going to make Russia the enemy, right? We're gonna, we got to worry about these reds. They're here. They're here right now. They're in your backyard, okay? Some that you don't know about the reds is they hide as plants. So, um, they push these McCarthyist ideas. And this is not anything new. Uh, again, if you remember back to when we covered the 1919 Seattle general strike, the 1919 Winnipeg general strike, the uh, 1921 uh, Blair Mountain strikes, the 1934 general strikes that happened in San Francisco, they used McCarthyist shit all the time. Uh, they were calling them uh, something of Lenin. There was some alliteration there, uh, Bolsheviks. Uh, the Bolshevism is in America, you know, so any, any time that anybody advocates for unionization, collective bargaining or strikes, they were always pushed as these Russian plots to destroy American freedoms and values. They were here, they're taking the hammer and they're beating the freedom out of you or they are cutting the freedom out of your chest with that sickle, right? And it's no different. I mean, this McCarthyism has not disappeared from our society, by the way. It's still very clear and present and it's it's in our society um, you know like it's it's still here it's no difference than the intelligence communities today that fight back against uh, or you know uh, movements like the Black Lives Matter movement anti-fracking movements pro LGBTQ movements they all blame that shit on Russia um, and and if you don't believe me there is an interview that Aaron Mate does on Pushback, which is his show on the Gray Zone. Highly recommend checking out Aaron Mate. Uh, he's the guy that kind of debunked, uh, that used the Mueller report to debunk Russiagate. And essentially was like, obst obstruction is not collusion. Uh, and, you know, was just like the ma corporate mainstream media has been pushing a conspiracy theory for three years. Uh, he does a conversation with a former CIA analyst that basically comes out and says, well, things like Black Lives Matter are used as Russian plots to destabilize the American government. And it's like, yeah, but also, you know, there is a large number of cops killing black people. There is a large number of cops killing innocent black people, innocent native people, innocent Mexican people. Uh, also, there's a lot of discrimination against gay people in this country. Also, they're fracking poisons the environment. Like, they're, uh, that's a fact. And just by saying that doesn't mean that you're a Russian. It's just, it just means that you have um, this really specific organ called eyes, uh, and you use this other very specific organ called your brain, and, uh, and you're able to understand facts. <laughs> So, back to the Taft-Hartley Act. Uh, the first thing that this does is destroy the Wagner Act. Now, the Wagner Act, some of you, if you remember the video we covered on the 1934 San Francisco general strikes, uh, the Wagner Act was put into place in 1935. Uh, basically, legitimized unions. It let uh, unions come in and in, into the workplace and negotiate on behalf of the worker um, and it kept anti-union propaganda out of the workplace. So you couldn't discriminate anybody for wanting to join a union. You couldn't, you couldn't fire somebody because they were part of a union or because they wanted to unionize. Um, you know, it, it kept the... It, the clause was that the employer was neutral in the workplace, um, that the employer was not going to interfere one way or the other 
in whether the employee wanted to join or did not want to join a union. They, they, they wouldn't make a swaying argument one way or the other. They would let the union kind of speak out and say, hey, this is who we are, this is what we do, um, these are our dues, do you want to join, here's how we can help you, here's how we've helped people in the past. And if the employee looks at that, if the worker looks at that and goes, nah, I don't, you know, that's not my bag, that's not my cup of tea, that's not what I'm interested in, then that's their right to do so. The employer cannot make that decision. And depending on that decision, they can't like fire the employee or take legal action against them or anything of that sort. That's what the Wagner Act in 1935 did. The Taft-Hartley Act uh, basically took that away where... Um, it let the, the employer uh, push back against the union. And it basically got that neutrality out. And what they claimed it did was give the employer a voice against unionization if they so chose to be against unionization. So if they wanted to, uh, the Taft-Hartley Act uh, would let the um, union, or I'm sorry, the employer, the corporation, uh, create anti-union messages under the guise, and this is literally what they say, is restoring balance between management and labor. Once again, right? Man labor, management, re relation, we're restoring, we're restoring balance. Uh, you're not restoring balance. There was neutrality in place. You know, unions could come in and make their case. The employee could, could make that decision themselves. They could look at the union and be like, you know, I don't like the dues. I don't want to pay any dues to be a part of this thing. You know, I don't care about collective bargaining. I trust the em employer. If that's their fucking, if that's what they believe, that's what they believe, right? The union isn't going to push to force these people into joining them. And the corporation isn't going to force them to, to, to not join them. It, it, it gives the employee, the worker, freedom to choose whether they want to be. And now this is essentially bring it's not restoring but it's it's disrupting the balance because now you have uh, companies like Amazon, Walmart, uh you know all these big corporations uh those are the two big union busting ones you know uh that kind of come out and they're like yeah no unions are bad they want to uh suck freedom out of your uh out of your heart so and that's <laughs> that's how they fucking present it there's cases like where people watch video after video about not unionizing because it's against freedom no the, no, the wagner act in act put put in freedom in 1935 the wagner act gave the employee freedom to join a union or not to be a part of collective bargaining or not and the employer coming in and saying hey it's communism or whatever the fuck propaganda they want to throw in there and made that legal in 1947, 12 years after the Wagner Act was written, it, it, it basically like it opened the doors to all the right to work laws and it opened the doors to anti-union propaganda being present in the workplace. This is not restoring balance and this is not freedom. So, it also ex uh, expanded executive power, so the uh, president and the attorney general um, could investigate and penalize unions, uh, you know, if if they if they deemed their actions against the uh, national emergency concerns, the national health concerns of the country. So, uh, let's say that a strike, uh, like an Amazon strike, was going to stop consumer goods from reaching people's homes. So under the Taft-Hartley Act, the president and the attorney general could claim that this strike was, um, you know, illegal and penalize the union, uh, put an injunction on the union, uh, you know, call uh, sue the unions for for creating a health national health emergency because now it's like oh my god the dildos aren't getting to to Americans' homes and they can't diddle themselves fast enough you know the the butt plugs are not reaching Americans' homes, and and people just have these, like, open assholes, like they're cats walking around these homes. Is that what you want? Is that, the, is that, is that how you want to live your life? We got to close up these buttholes. That's what America believes in. That's what America was built on, and that's what Amazon is trying to do. They're just trying to regulate American buttocks and these strikers are getting in the way 
of Americans having the freedom to regulate their buttocks. And the, and the president and the attorney general, thanks to the Taft-Hartley Act, have the executive thing to look at the unions to be like, you are now penalized. We're going to run an investigation uh, 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 about the unions uh, striking and calling for collective bargaining uh, that created this national health crisis of buttock regulations. So uh, in order to strike under the Taft-Hartley Act, um, the unions have to say, you have to give them 80 days. Um, they give them 80 days to collectively bargain with the corporation. And if, and if it's, uh, if it's a, uh, if it's between the management, like supervisory management, uh, so somebody like a general manager or something. So they have to give them 60 days to call a strike. So within those 60 days, they have to collective bargain and they have to come up with terms. So, you know, if they basically call a no strike order during the 60 days, they can't strike. And if they don't reach a collective bargaining thing and they're like, you told you, you said no strikes, uh, it blocks the unions from utilizing that as a tactic, which is bullshit. And again, if they go, if they strike and and the president or the attorney general claim that it is a national health and safety concern it's a national health and safety emergency they can put an executive uh, order in place to conduct an investigation penalize the union for striking um, and 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 essentially disband the strike right but this is all restoring balance we're restoring balance to America. This bill is, um, is the butt plug of all bills. I'm going to let you guys sit with that one for a minute. <clears throat> um, <laughs> it's, but it does give uh, it does give corporations an opportunity to continue their terrible treatment of employees, right? So you have sixty days to come up with a negotiating plan, um, sixty days to to talk about collective bargaining, sixty uh, sixty to eight well sixty to eighty days, um, depending on if it's with a supervisor or with the corporation itself, uh, you know. And there's no strike orders put into place, so it just lets corporations do whatever the fuck they want. So even if the corporations are like, no, we're not going to collectively bargain. Uh, the unions are kind of stuck in our between a rock and a hard place. So, and it also makes wildcat strikes impossible to do because of this, right? Because uh, in order for you to in order for it to be a legitimate strike, with in if, if there is a no if there isn't a no strike order put into place by the corporation thanks to the Taft Hartley Act, uh, you can't just up and walk out. So technically speaking, despite the fact that striking and even wildcat strikes are within your legal right to do as an American worker, it makes it harder to claim the legality of it thanks to the Taft-Hartley Act. So even if you walk out of your job because Amazon knew about COVID-19 cases, knew that somebody was sick in the warehouse and they didn't shut down the warehouse to clean everything, to make sure that everything is secure, to make sure that everything is sanitized, and they knew as a corporation, and they told the upper management not to tell any of them, and the upper management decides that they're going to run a wildcat strike, the corporations can do whatever the fuck they want. They're not, they're not at fault for putting the public in danger and then claiming that, oh, the unions are against the public. No, motherfucker, you're against the public. <laughs> and that is exactly what happened with Amazon at the end of March when they fired Chris Smalls. Now, really what the Taft-Hartley bill did is it took advantage of the fact uh, that unions represented all the workers. And they do. They represent all the workers. So regardless of what the results of these strikes were, regardless of the collective bargainings were, all the, all the employees would benefit. So if you have employees that are not part of a union, they still benefit from it. If you have employees that are part of a union, they still benefit from it. So let's say you're an employee that's part of a union and you go on strike 
and you, you and then there's other employees that are not part of the union that go in and they still make the money that they make on a daily basis right and the striking employees they don't get paid uh at all and then they get you know a a 25 percent raise uh everybody gets so so now the the non-strikers the non-union employees got paid uh for working during the strike and they they just got the benefit of that collective bargaining so it de-incentivizes you from joining the union you know so the employee goes why the fuck would i join this union regardless of what the fuck happens i win right and now Sure, you can make the argument that if if the union was backed uh, by like some government subsidies or something like that, like by a government fund, um, if, if it was like a nationalized thing, and you know they were they were part of the labor department or something, sure, okay, they're they're getting money regardless. They're they're an organization that exists regardless of whether people are paying dues or not. Uh, maybe it comes out of taxes or something, right? But even then you would have people pit bitching and moaning about it. Even then you would have people pissed off about it, right? So really the question should be is if the unions are on the side of the worker, if the unions are going to go to bat for the working class people and you are going to benefit as a member of the working class, you are going to benefit from it, why would you not support them in the first place? Why would you continue to go work for a corporation that treats you like shit, that doesn't give you what you want, that keeps you away from your family? Why? Because of this desire that you need to work. Maybe you don't need to, maybe you need to work, but you don't need to work at that job. And then this also allows the corporation to scapegoat the unions. So if the collective bargaining agreement fails if it if it's not reached then the corporation could be like look the unions were overreaching over here they were asking for the moon all right they were literally like we want 30 percent of the moon and that's just crazy so we just couldn't give them anything because we clearly they're unstable right and then it makes the corporations look like the good guys because the unions were going over the top and crazy and stuff if the collective bargaining went through then these bosses get to claim that they're the heroes that they're the ones that did the right thing. You know, they negotiated really well. They are champions of negotiating. They're super smart because they have a lot of money. And I don't know if you know this, but the more cash you have, uh, there's like in the back of your head, you can just deposit money and it increases your brain power. I don't know if you guys know this or not. A lot of poors, a lot of us poors don't know that because we're too stupid to realize that because we're just putting like pennies in that slot. And that's not enough. You got to put 20s in there. So, and the, and I mean, you know, obviously the rich are able to do that, but it scapegoats them. It, it gives these people an opportunity uh, to scapegoat them. Now, uh, th what the Taft-Hartley Act did also say as a way to kind of win over a bunch of people is that there are free speech protections what we're doing is we're giving free speech protections to the employer and the supervisors to make all the statements they want against unions. And that is part of their free speech. And we're protecting their free speech to say things about unions. Uh, it's probably not true, you know, that, that they're communist, that they're, uh, that, that they're against American values, that they're trying to steal freedoms and money away from the worker that it's not good for the worker you know they get to say all that and the taft hartley act is protecting their freedom of speech now the opposite is not true if you come out and say that this corporation is not treating the employees very well uh that the employees deserve better wages better work conditions that they should be able to work uh, only eight hours a day that they should get weekends that they should be paid overtime uh, that they shouldn't have to be in death-defying conditions, that they deserve a lunch break, that they deserve to go home and see their kids, that they don't have to work two, three jobs to make ends meet, to make sure that all their bills are covered by just having that one job, making sure that their health insurance isn't a, 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 a hostage situation that links them to their job. To fight for all of that, that's communism. And that means that you are committing treason and you are going against America. 
There's no free speech protections for the unions. There's no free speech protections for the, for the employee to speak out against a corporation. But there is free speech protections for corporations to straight up fucking lie. So um, there are uh, six key amendments that I want to talk to you about that I want to make sure that I get to regarding the Taft-Hartley Act. Uh, some of the stuff we've gone over um, as we've talked about this. So the first one is an affirmation that the Wagner Act intends to protect workers' rights uh, to join or uh, form or join unions and to engage in collective bargaining with their employers remains intact. And it does, right? They still have the right to do that. Um, it's, it's, um, it's just beyond that. Things start getting a little questionable. Uh, a section that shields workers from being coerced into joining unions and imposes penalties for discriminating against employees who uh, refuse to join unions. So that's basically the last two things we talked about. It's the free speech protection. So uh, it lets corporations talk shit on, on unions if they feel like talking shit on unions. Um, and it ensures that everybody gets the benefits of the unions, which, you know, from, from the research that I've done, from, from all the things that I've read, um, the, the AFL, the, the, the Longshoremen's Union, the coal unions, the minor unions, regardless of whether you were part of the union or not, you got the benefit anyway. This just kind of took advantage of that and put it into law um, saying that you don't need to join a union. This is basically like the unions would go in and be like, we're going to fight for your behalf. So you might as well like keep an organization that's going to fight for your behalf funded. Um, and, and we'll always make sure that you are the, you know, you're, 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 you're the first thing that we think about. The worker is the first thing that we think about. Um, a statement that a corporation or business owner cannot deny a prospective employee a job solely based on their decision not to join a union, uh, except in certain exempted industries. Uh, I think construction was one of those industries uh, where I think they gave like a week or something or there, there was some clause about um, like certain industries you need to be part of a union um, and the union person gets like more precedence than a non-union person because I think there's just more protections involved in certain industries. But it's, it's interesting that the, the, it, it's that they can't deny an employee for not joining a union as if the unions are going to come in and be like, no get rid of this person, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think they did, because the, considering the fact that the unions were representing all workers, that was the point um, of, of unions to begin with. Uh, a provision that gives employers the right to sign labor agreements with union officials that requires certain employees in specific industries to join their organization no later than 30 days after they're hired. Uh, this is the other one that I want <laughs> that I really want to hammer home. A stipulation stating that unions must bargain in good faith with employers. Basically, this is this is a statement to me that's saying, um, well, uh, the unions are going to give in to what corporations want. The corporations get to say get get to kind of play hostage negotiator here, uh, and realistically, the corporate corporations are the ones that are holding rights and hostage. Uh, people don't need to bring in collective bargaining if the corporation listened to the employees and was like, hey, our work conditions suck and we aren't getting paid enough. Uh, rents are going up. Food prices are going up. We'd like our wages to meet that. And the corporations is like, this is highway robbery, communist, right? Um, and then this is another one that uh, I think is important. A prohibition of secondary boycotts by unions stating that unions cannot coerce or uh, urge other entities from engaging with that employer if a labor organization union is embroiled in a dispute with an employer. This is essentially saying that you can't have sympathy strikes. That you can't call for other um, uh, other unions to join in on a sympathy strike. And it was very much a way, um, or to me seems like a way, to um, push back on general strikes. So it's going to be very difficult for them to create a uh, a general strike because you can't get other unions involved. You can't get other industries involved to uh, put pressure on. So like Amazon, um, you know, under the Taft-Hartley Act would not be able to, 
um, they wouldn't be able to get people from like the Walmart coalition or the uh, fast food industry or the gig economy industry and say that they're in, in strike and solidarity. So tr it's essentially a, a, a provision within the Taft-Hartley Act that uh, attempts to take away solidarity from the American worker, which is bullshit. So there was an amendment in 1959, this uh, Langram-Griffin Act uh, amendment. So let's, let's read through a couple of these. Um, so the state labor relations board and state courts were accorded legal purview over cases declined by the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, there's something called hot cargo packs in which rival employers uh, take concerted actions with the unions in, uh, in advance of a boycott against uh, another during a subsequent labor dispute and provisions that tightened secondary boycott injunctions. I think this is basically like uh, rival corporations can't come in and try to like offer better, um, you know, better wages, better work conditions and, and negotiate with the unions, um, which I get. Prohibited unions from picketing for the recognition of organizational support. Uh, so it basically kind of revokes the Wagner Act in this in this case, that they can't be represent representative of that. Um, that they can't be represented, it delegitimizes the unions. It doesn't. It doesn't see them as a legitimate entity in terms of, uh, in, in, dur during during picketing. Uh, the construction industry was allowed to establish pre-hire and seven-day union shop contracts. So that's one of the ones where I think unions union workers are preferred over non-union workers. Uh, permanently replaced strikers were accorded the right to vote in union elections within one year after the start of a strike. So basically, these are strike breakers that get hired, get to vote uh, in union elections, and they're going to vote on in accordance with the corporations. Um, so that kind of, again, took a little bit of power from unionized workers. Uh, the requirement for an affidavit me mandating union officials w swear in an oath that they are not communist uh, was, was repe repealed. That was a pretty authoritarian thing to, to, to make them claim that they weren't communists. Um, so that oath was repealed with this, with this amendment, uh, which is good, but it didn't really stop red baiting in that era uh, because here we are, we're still red baiting today. Uh, establish a code of conduct assuring union members will have certain rights within their union while imposing enhanced reporting requirements on union, union officers, employers, uh, or consultants. So this puts more regulations on, on what unions can do and kind of deregulates the corporate industry. Um, so those are some of the important little amendments that I, that I wanted to kind of make note of um, that I thought was kind of important to talk about. Now, there were some attempts to try to get rid of the Taft-Hartley Act. And the Taft-Hartley Act is still in place today, by the way. Um, Clinton, Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, they talked about it. They talked against it. Uh, but they got Republican opposition, and then they bailed. They didn't really put up a fight. And that goes kind of in line with how the Democratic Party has acted in accordance with worker rights. They'll say that they stand for worker rights. And publicly, they'll you know come out and make a big stink. Oh, the Taft-Hartley Act, it's not good. It's terrible for workers, blah, blah, blah. And then they just won't do anything about it. You know, the Republicans will come out and make a statement, and the Democrats will go, well, we tried. Well, we got, well, and then they fucking bail. So nothing gets done. Uh, and, you know, it, it kind of confirms and solidifies that the two-party system is not on our side. We are not at the negotiating table when it comes to the two-party system. The Taft-Hartley Act being in place today, you know, and there's, there's a lot of bills. This was written by a Republican. The Espionage Act was not. 
The Espionage Act was written by a Democrat, and that is still in play today. And these acts, these bills, are the ones that really take away our freedoms, really take away, um, you know, the things that we stand for. And, uh, and these part, I mean, this half-hearted measure that you are for the worker, that you are for freedom of speech, that you stand against or you stand with the people is how the Democrats have acted. They don't really care about the working class. They just need to show that it looks like they care about the working class. If they actually cared about it, then Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton would have pushed against it. But that's not what they wanted. Bill Clinton especially. Bill Clinton was trying to push the Democratic Party further to the right. Um, and, and, you know, govern in that direction. And keeping the Taft-Hartley bill in place is a way to ensure that the country is still shifted to the right. And it shouldn't be. That's not how most people line up with. I think most people line up with standing in solidarity with the working class, making sure that we are taken care of and making sure that we have uh, a governing body and an economic body that takes us into account. And that's what it should be. And that's what we should be fighting for. That's what we should be protesting for. That's what we should be, um, you know, standing up uh, to, to ensure that our rights and our voices are represented in, a, in this government and this economic system moving forward. That's what we should be fighting to create. All right, folks, uh, that is the conclusion of today's uh, road reflection. This is a bit, I know this got a bit, a bit of a long one. We got, we, we, we got a little deeper into these two subjects, uh, which is why I'm only doing two subjects. I tend to be getting deeper into these, into these things. Um, and uh, I, hope you guys, I hope you guys don't mind some of these being a little bit longer. Um, you know, uh, I, and, and if, if you can't watch the, the th this, this thing because it's, it's too long, I do put up clips. Uh, I do clip these out and put them up individually. So if you need to check them out later, if you're like, if you later, if you're like, hey, I, I, I want to hear about these these protests, but I don't really care about the Taft Hartley Act, or I do care about the Taft Hartley Act, but I, I'm not, I've had enough of this news about these militia protests and all this other stuff. Um, individual clips of those do go up on my page, so you can keep an eye out for that. Uh, but once again, make sure you're subscribed and you hit that bell so you get notifications when I put up these videos. I am putting these up every day. Um, so whether it's YouTube or Facebook, whatever your methodology of uh, enjoying this content, please make sure you're subscribed to it. Please make sure you hit that bell. The more subscriptions and the more likes we get, the more it shows uh, the channel and the video to uh, other people. It pops it up on the, on the feeds a little bit more. Um, and uh, like I said, I got some pretty fun uh, projects that I'm working on. Uh, the Taboo Table Talk Small Business Project, the Forkful of Noodles that are going to be coming out, the uh, Zoom stand-up comedy shows. Um, and if you want to be a part of the test show to help figure out the direction of those, the tickets are available for that. Grab those tickets. Uh, there's, there's a space for 10 people, and that's this Saturday. 8.30 p.m. I will send out the information for the Zoom logins an hour before the show. Um, and uh, and then I've got my album coming out. Uh, an event for that will go up soon-ish, I think. Um, as soon as, I mean, as soon as I can um, get, get, get the links up and everything, I still have to wait for the approval uh, from from the you know the iTunes and all that shit. Um, so I'm waiting on that. Once that's done, I'll have everything ready to to go. I'll put up an event. Uh, so so a bunch of stuff is coming out. Uh, I'm I'm excited. I hope you guys are excited too. I hope you guys are staying healthy. I hope you guys are staying well. I hope you guys are staying safe. Um, and as always, there there's a link to donate if you um, if you can if you want to donate. Um, uh, you know, feel free to, uh, that you can become a sustaining member. You can make a one-time donation, uh, whatever it is, 
uh, that uh, that you can afford. It's not a it's not a requirement. It's not mandatory. It's a to me it's a, just an extra piece of appreciation for these for enjoying these videos. Uh, another big way: like, share, and make sure you're subscribed. Uh, and if you are going to download my albums, I would highly recommend going through the Bandcamp because they are more friendly to the artists. All of my stuff is available as pay what you want right now, uh, but they're giving 100% back to the artist. But uh, till tomorrow, we'll see you on the road. Stay safe.